All right, I think we're gonna wait just a minute or so to get everyone else a few more seconds to join on. Okay. Sylvia, are you in Puerto Rico? Yes, I am in Puerto Rico. I am at the plant. Um, it's a beautiful weather down there right now. It's wonderful weather, uh, blue sky, sunny. It's around a little bit warm, around 90, 92 at this time. But it's really nice, very breezy. <laughs> Sounds delightful. Yeah, it's excellent going to the beach. <laughs> I have to work, but. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, Isel. Nice to see you joining on. Um, so we've got some people popping up in the chat as you're uh, joining us for this edition of Full Hands and Full Hands Out. You go ahead and use the chat box to say hi. Uh, let us know um, that you're here, or where you're visiting from. Um, my name is Rhiannon Enlil, and I am joined by Joanne Spiegel and Justin Lane Briggs. Um, we're going to be talking about our career paths and re-envisioning re ourselves in the hospitality industry. Uh, but most importantly, I am joined with by Miss Silvia Santiago in Puerto Rico. Silvia, take it away. Hello. Uh, hello, everybody. I'm so happy. Uh, and on behalf of Destileria Serrayes, I say congratulations, people. Sorry, I am saving uh, the environment, you know? <laughs> <laughs> if I stay, <laughs> stay um, without moving for a long time, the lights go up. Um, yes, uh, Silvia Santiago, I am the Senior Vice President of Destileria Serrayes in the manufacturing area. Um, it's, it's really um, a wonderful work to produce the best rum in the world and to taste it every day. <laughs> uh, but we feel very proud to really support this, this activity, it's um, the revisioning. I was just thinking about this revisioning, reinventing. Those are the words that we have been uh, listening more and more due to the COVID situation that affected us for more than a year and a half. And sometimes really, I think that those words, even though they are very inspiring ones, uh, they, they don't really reflect the pain, the fear that uh, affected us, especially the service industry. Even us that we have been in the business for over 150 years, uh, we have suffered and we have had to change the way in which we make business to work, uh, work with the people. And, and it's, it's really painful. I know I've, I've uh, seen many of uh, bartenders, mixologists, how they they change. So in, in, in spite of the pain, in spite of the fear, really the action makes the difference. And that's important. And, and part of the action is what you are doing today uh, improving yourself, growing yourself in the personal way, and finding new ways in which we can keep moving on. Thanks God, we are seeing uh, light at the end of the tunnel, and uh, we will be coming back to the business. In, in our case, we changed um, when everything stopped back in, in March uh, 2020. Almost all industries uh, just had to close their operations and, and we were supposed to do so, but we decided, no, let's, let's change. We cannot make the rum at this moment. Well, we can make alcohol to help our community. And uh, that's what we did. We, we didn't have to stop uh, our operation. We didn't have to stop the distillery. We kept producing alcohol and also kept producing rum. So we in, reinvented ourselves in that, in that way. And I've seen a lot of people, a lot of bartenders working um, at a distance using all kinds of um, media to keep contacting the customers and to keep going on. So that's so important. And, and being, you know, knowing that you are here, that you keep doing that, it's great. 
So really congratulations. That's why you are, you are our ambassadors. We produced our rums knowing that you will be there to present them, to serve them in the best way. So really congratulations and as much as we can, we will, be, we will keep backing you up. So keep learning and keep growing. Wish you the best. Thank you, Sylvia. Thank you, Don Q. Um, well, that's uh, wonderful, wonderful and inspiring. Um, so for those of you who are joining uh, the session now, please um, go ahead and you can jump in the chat, you can introduce yourself. Um, but basically what we're going to go through is a, a conversation about all of our experiences as bartenders and kind of evolving into additional um, roles in the industry and kind of where we're at now. Um, there is a, a couple of polls that are going to be popping up in the chat. For example, are you a member of the Cocktail Apprentice Program alumni? Um, yes, no, or maybe someday. So as that pops up, go ahead and uh, just participate in the polls if you can. And then um, there's going to be a couple of other polls popping up, or at least at least one, um, where maybe you can consider thinking of describing yourself as either an introvert or an extrovert, or it's complicated. Uh, because, you know, those, those are little pigeonholed categories, but sometimes, you know, we're a little bit of everything. Um, but I would like to start off the panel by uh, asking one of our panelists to introduce herself. Joe, could you please tell us um, who you are, when you were a cap, um, when you started bartending, what your position is now, and a little bit about your journey? Sure. Um, my name is Joanne Spiegel, and I capped for the first time in 2011, 2012, 2013, 2014, and then did a, an experimental pro kitchen, uh, one year alive and never to be seen again, pro kitchen in 2015. Um, I've been a bartender. I came to this country from Ireland uh, in 1998, and, you know, as an immigrant coming over uh, on a just a summer visa, there there wasn't many avenues open up. So uh, the, the choices of being, you know, maybe uh, babysitting or nannying or cleaning hotels or bartending uh, and serving and whatnot. Um, I don't come from a, an environment of a tipped society. So once I figured out in um, hospitality that you could almost write your own wage with a little bit of hustle and kind of understanding of the kind of uh, the human side of things. If you, if you can work people, you can work that tip up. And uh, if, you, if you're a game for it, you could pick up as many shifts as you want. So suddenly I'm in America with uh, the, the, the road and the path set out of front, in front of me that you could really, you know, it really was the kind of uh, land of opportunities. So bartending it was from 1998 on and many years just being in that kind of pocket of, um, neighborhood bars, Irish bars, sports bars, high volume clubs. I mean, I was not aware at all of the craft community until I landed in Tales for the first time in 2010. So about, you know, 12 years into my uh, bartending in America experience, did I realize that there was a whole other avenue uh, open up. So a lot has changed in that decade, but up to then, uh, my definition of, of, of a bartender was exactly what I was doing at the time, tending to my bar, tending to my people, and uh, not much beyond the, the front door of, of the establishment I would be currently in at that time, you know? Fabulous. What's your uh, job position now? Uh, so now I'm the general manager of um, a franchise called uh, Miracle Pop-Up and Sipping Santa, well, Beach Bum Berry presents Sipping Santa. So it's uh, a bit of a crazy um, pop-up, uh, like Christmas themed uh, that pops up around um, November and goes all the way till pretty much the first week in January for some of our locations. Um, and it's, uh, you know, uh, a crazy cocktail a immersive event at this stage that uh, started here in New York with us in 2014 um, and I got roped into kind of uh, building it beyond the New York location and actually turning it into a franchise and 
learning along the way, everything that might go with that and under, underneath that heading. And, uh, you know, as us bartenders and hospitality folks do, hustling and, and learning and, uh, you know, adapting to new skill sets that we learn on the fly and, and then rolling it over each and every year to, to, to get more strengths from the people around us. So a whole new avenue, but still underneath the, the umbrella of hospitality, uh, obviously, because I need to partner with existing bars and existing operators and, and, and bartenders around the world now. We're, we're, we're um, well outside of America. So it's interesting, we have about 150 partner locations at this stage. That's incredible. Um, do you ever get to step behind a bar anymore or is that just, is that chapter closed and you just get to orchestrate? Not completely. So, you know, I still, I work for Cocktail Kingdom, so that's the parent company. So there's always some cocktail class that I get roped into, which I absolutely love to be able to come in, you know, for an hour or two hours and uh, to be able to do a class, whether it's in one of the locations or, or privately around New York. I also create the menu for the Miracle franchise. So I still have my flex of being able to have that creative outlet, which I think, you know, and maybe you guys will uh, identify with this or anyone listening, you know, once you're, once you're a bartender, a lot of my identity for a long time was just like, hey, I'm Joe, I'm a bartender, you know, rather than like, hey, Joe, I'm a human or I'm a mother or I'm this or that. And some part of me, whether it's, you know, years later, I still identify as a bartender, you know, a, a large portion of me rather than the whole piece, you know, so I don't think there's escaping. I think that's it's in our system, you know, for, for, for good, what, whether we want to remove ourselves from it or not, there's, there's trace elements always left behind, right? Definitely. It feels like um, Miracle is, is like bartending adjacent. It's like all the other intensity around uh, putting together programs without actually doing the like nightly hustle, oh, right? Oh yeah, absolutely. And, and beautifully so I get to connect with all the operators in, in every market you know in North America Europe you know Asia South America and, and just talk about um, you know their operations so I'm still really much in the mix of the kind of nerdy conversations us hospitality folks like to have I just have a, a much um, wider um, network again you know so things like we, we, we've all done like tales and uh, things like that continuously widen our network and, and miracle, miracle, I use that network to widen it even further. So I'm always, I'm always talking the talk. <laughs> awesome. Um, Justin, similar question. Um, tell us about your background in bartending and a little bit about your evolution and where you are today. Uh, sure, I uh, started, I guess, <clears throat> actually same year. My first bartending gig was in uh, 1998 at a pizzeria in Vermont. Um, and I moved to New York City in the uh, very dawn of the aughts, just, just post September 11th, and uh, started paying my way through school by bartending and then kind of really fell in love with it. I was kind of lucky enough to be you know, working behind the bar uh, at places that were, that were like, peripherally aware of the kind of cocktail renaissance happening all around us. And you know, a lot of those were like in the East Village and in Williamsburg, Brooklyn. And so it was sort of, uh, again, kind of like falling into, you know, very luckily into a happenstance of being around um, the kind of burgeoning cocktail movement at a really, really watershed moment. Um, and so kind of kept grabbing onto some of that energy myself. Um, I grew up in, in, again, in Vermont in the organic farming community. So a, a, an avenue that I got really excited about uh, in terms of cocktails or in terms of spirits very early on was connecting the dots between agricultural products and, um, and what was in the bottle. And so that kind of became a platform that I talked about for a long time. So um, after after years of uh, bartending and you know bartending for other people, but also running my own programs and uh, kind of bouncing around to a lot of like farm to table restaurants and um, more and other kinds of restaurants and kind of like doing you know, doing a lot of consultation and things like that in the in the late aughts early 2000 teens. Um, also went to Tales, uh, met Joe there in 2011 um, as a cap. Had a wonderful time. Also returned many years. Um, I think my last year was 2015. Um, and around 2013, I started, uh, I was kind of tapped because of that, um, that, which I'm sure we're gonna delve into more, that, that conversation about um, beyond cocktails, beyond spirits, like how, how are things made? What are the, what are the kind of uh, methods of production, methods and like in situations of ownership and things like that that are behind the spirits that we're working with? That was, again, the kind of the platform that I 
fell into, I think in large part because of my upbringing around the organic farming community and um, was tapped to help create a, a spirit portfolio based on that perspective, based on asking questions surrounding, surrounding that perspective. Terroir driven spirits, spirits that are driven by conscientious production, uh, spirits that are driven by conscientious ownership, things like that. Um, and I've been doing that ever since. So that's uh, with Sternic Wines and Spirits, which is where I'm still working now. Um, for the last eight years or so, I've been, uh, I had been spirit specialist and educator for Skernic Wines and Spirits, which meant that I was curating the, the portfolio alongside the portfolio manager, Adam Schumann. Um, I was also uh, doing a lot of things like a lot of education, a lot of staff trainings, a lot of developing menus, a lot of um, developing products with our uh, distiller partners, um, really kind of you know, a ground up approach to a spirit portfolio, which has been wonderful. It's also both he and I were bartenders who kind of were thrown into the mix in doing this job and kind of like had to figure out how to do it on the fly. And you know, it wasn't really a, a thing that existed before. So, which I think is sort of also germane to what we're talking about today. It was sort of like, this, this role doesn't exist. Go figure out what it means, you know? No one taught us how to be, uh, how, to, how to run a spirit portfolio, how to be on the sales side, the back of house side of a spirits distribution or importing company, um, or especially how to like participate in creation of, of new products. And uh, we just kind of figured it out on our own the entire way. Um, and it's, it's done pretty well. And uh, now we have a whole team of spirits specialists and educators. And um, very recently, I am now uh, actually no longer titled spirit specialist and educator. I'm now um, national spirits uh, sales manager and uh, portfolio manager for all of our Mexican spirits in particular. Nice. Um, so kind of honing in on uh, some some specific areas of our growing work. That's, that's in a nutshell, my backstory. That's fantastic. You mentioned that's like a, you kind of had to figure it out as you go along, Joe. It sort of feels like that's what was going on with Miracle as you were developing it as well. It's funny, like when Justin, when you said that, I, I was reminded of, remember we were all capping and you'd go in and to, to try to one of the heads, like John, and be like, hey, I have this problem. And his response would always be, figure it out because he mm -hmm. knew he'd know there would be the answer somewhere and he'd be like you can figure it out and and in real life yeah I mean I've taken those and every time we have to figure it out I hear that echo of him just sitting in that chair knowing he has the answer but not willing to share it because we know we can get there you know just figuring it out should be a tattoo <laughs> on my backside somewhere you know that and making sure we always have a sharpie yeah <laughs> <laughs> I have Sharpies Velcroed on walls all throughout this building, just so that there's always one nearby. Um, so for our viewers uh, who don't know me, I, I was not actually in the CAP program for many years as the two of you were. I was part of the first year Cocktail Apprentice program in 2008, uh, when there was a grand total of 17 of us. Uh, it was incredible, and I'm very, very grateful for that experience, but being a resident of New Orleans, um, I opted to just stay behind the bars the entire time Tales was coming through, um, but I always, like, always have had a special place in my heart for the cabs, and if I could sneak into that Montelion kitchen uh, during the week, I would just to come and say hi, but um, I moved to New Orleans and started bartending uh, right after I turned 18, so I really didn't have any other career path besides being a bartender and being in the service industry. I didn't move to New Orleans for school. Um, I didn't come here for a job. I honestly just pictured myself drinking coffee and smoking clove cigarettes, writing poetry because I was 18 and it was the French Quarter. Um, <laughs> but I ended up bartending and really kind of fell in love with it, um, mostly because of the guest facing hospitality side right? I didn't know anything about cocktails or drinks and honestly didn't care for quite a few years. I was really just interested in being in the midst of the party without actually having to be in the party. I think that was a big part of the appeal, especially in my youth. So well put, so well put. Yeah. I like that three feet of wood where I can kind of feel the energy, but I'm still, I've got elbow room and I have something to do. Um, I, can, I can walk away and be busy if I need to. <laughs> ding, ding, ding. <laughs> I, um, I did catch the, the cocktail bug though. I really did. Once I went to tails, I got really obsessive and invested into craft cocktails as we call it these days. But really for me, it was about historic drinks. I realized that I liked all of the history and the legend of cocktails such to the tune that uh, by my mid thirties, I decided to go to community college and uh, pay cash out of pocket until I ended up graduating from the University of New Orleans with a history degree, completely 
prepared to leave bartending behind and start over from scratch as a person in library science or information science or history. I was thinking, you know, it's been a great 15, 20 years, maybe it's time to do something else. Uh, but instead, I was given the opportunity to work on a project here in New Orleans called the Sazerac House, which for all intents and purposes is a multi-story cocktail museum. And it is really, really incredible. And it's combining both of these loves of mine. Um, and what's really great in my perspective is that I still get to be relatively in hospitality, although maybe more bartending adjacent, um, but definitely still interested in education and spirits education and you know historical storytelling essentially. Um, which kind of leads me to our, my second question is, you know, we all have long careers uh, behind the bar and working in uh, different types of establishments, whether it's everything from a neighborhood bar to a nightclub to fine dining. Um, and we could have all left for any particular reason um, and maybe just decided to start a career at some point doing something entirely different. But instead, we're all, all still here. We all still have something to do with uh, beverage and hospitality. Um, Justin, what is your what is your driving motivator for staying put, and um, what kind of kept you in the industry? Hmm. I think, um, I mean, uh, tenacity. No, I think when I was when I was younger, it was always sort of a, a you know, I, I think I you know I was mentioning this to you before. I was always very like ride or die. Like I'm like I'm like I had kind of when I kind of came to the the community of bartending and you know fell in love with it, especially the community of it's the community of cocktails and bartending really much more so, you know, I wasn't, wasn't particularly in love with um, they were my earlier days of bartending, although I did, as you were just describing, love being like in the center of the party and at the same time able to remove myself. So that kind of suited my like, as, as I think we're gonna come back to, my kind of like introvert extrovert uh, propensity. Um, but I fell in love with that like larger, larger kind of cocktail community and, and the conversation that we were all having uh, in, in New Orleans and, uh, here in New York and you know in New Orleans I mean specifically at Tales um, on you know, as I started to meet other bartenders from all over the place I kind of fell in love with this larger kind of uh, sense of uh, fellow travelers you know uh, that 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 is a really powerful powerful uh, thing and I think that that kept me in but um, the other thing that kept me in was that I felt like there was as, as this world grows and as craft spirits and craft cocktails continue to grow um, as slow food and in general as a movement continues to grow as our questions about how we're again sourcing things how we're caring for the things we put into our bodies how we're caring for the things that we use behind our bars or in our food and drink programs um, that conversation continues to evolve i saw that there was a, a space that i wanted to be involved in i wanted to continue to help be a part of that and to and i had perspectives on it that i wanted to keep on sharing um, so i think the one thing that kept me in you know, I, I couldn't keep I really could not physically keep bartending. You know, I, I reached a stage of like pretty severe uh, physical burnout at a certain point in my career, um, which was very well timed with the opportunity to start working on this portfolio. And that has been like, the, the opportunity to like take the small platform that I had from behind the bar where I could talk to people about what I was passionate about, about the, you know, again, like the production and sourcing of spirits about um, questions about, you know, how the, how this larger, System will move. Will it kind of lean into conglomeration, or will it lead, lead into uh, more small independent producers and th these sorts of things? You know, I had the tiny little world to talk about that with my guests, and I loved it. But what's kept me here has been the ability to have a, a growing space to talk about that, to actually talk about that now with more bartenders who have their own little platforms, their own spaces to talk about that with their guests, and to kind of continue on, um, hopefully, kind of like spreading my nefarious tentacles of little independent spirits all over the place, and kind of bringing that conversation to ideally more more people who uh, who at least ask questions. So that's, that's I think been a, a big part of what's kept me involved. And I, you know that and the that and like the love of like good food and drink keeps coming back all the time. I think that's yeah. Yeah, there you go. Can't help that. Um, I love it. It's almost like you're uh, you're like a traveling preacher for these these <laughs> very important missions. Um, and that's great because bartenders can then just continue to latch on to your passion and enthusiasm. Um, you did mention the introvert extrovert poll. So all of our uh, viewers, we're going to submit that poll. Um, like I mentioned, if you would participate, just let us know if you consider yourself uh, an introvert, an extrovert, uh, or maybe it's a little bit more complicated than that. 
Um, but let's see, Joe, um, similar question. How, how did you decide to transition from bartending into where you're at? What kept you in the industry? What keeps you here and keeps that drive alive? Um, Cause you know, you could have, you could have done anything. You could have gone anywhere. You know, it, my reason for staying has changed, you know, through different courses of my own, you know, where I was personally in my own development and I mean, that should not have even been sneaking in right now. Um, so I think when I first came here, you know, bartending in places like the Jersey Shore or, you know, Fort Lauderdale, it was really our neighborhoods in, in, in Philly, South Philly or the Northeast of Philly. And everywhere I bartended was such a, uh, I don't know, a, a different view of different cultures in America. And I do love the kindness of strangers and this kind of, you know, like moments in time that you have with these people that you may never see again. If it's, if it's down the shore towns or down in Florida, a lot of people came in and that kind of like vacation and they come in at high and they share this really cool like little snapshot of their lives with you and it's something like you said earlier on great to be part of a party when you're behind a bar and protected from actually having to be in the party and you know as a, as a non-american just kind of standing back and it would be like watching a movie for me so just seeing the different cultures and seeing the different antics of all the crazy that was happening on going this country is wild you know and you know, Philadelphia was very, very different. I've seen kind of more, it was my first experience of, of real neighborhood bars. So getting to know kind of uh, local steam fitters or construction guys, as opposed to like the, the Wall Street guys of, of, of that would come in in a, in a different bar I'd worked in. And each time at that point of my life, it offered just a, a real education onto the cultural differences and the diversity of this country. And it kept me really entertained uh, and fascinated with Americans and, and mm. what I could get out of that. And then as I went through my own, you know, personal growth and, um, you know, maybe a dark period of my life, it, it offered me escapism. It offered me a place of where, you know, I could definitely, like I'd said to you guys when we were talking uh, yesterday, I always had that thing when I'm, I'm managing people of like, hey, you know, you can leave your, your, your personal bag and baggage at the front door, come in and this is your stage for the evening and we're going to, you know, morph into the characters that we put on to be able to have a good time for everybody else there and be, you know, be part of that. Uh, and that served me well through a dark period of where I didn't have to come in and be Joe with X and Y problem. I could be Joe the bartender or Joe the manager and, you know, make sure that the, the music and the lighting and, and the vibe was on point and feed off that energy. And I, I absolutely credit that with my survival for a large period of, of that dark time. And mm. You know, coming out of that, I think the slippery slope is that, you know, when you pack your stuff at the front door, but you're always in the bar and you're working all the time, sometimes it might grow a little moss in the corner as you forget to pick it back up. And you, you might not deal with those real life situations because you're living in the, the moment of bartending and managing a bar that has a, a tendency to you know, uh, make you say yes a lot and make you forget about your own needs because it's always somebody else's. It's either the operator that you're working for, it's the, the liquor reps that need favors, it's all the guests that have their own situations that they want your ear on or your advice on. So I think a lot of the times then when I was coming out of that, I, I didn't have space to kind of hear my own voice in all that. So I think that, you know, was that's kind of going into the window of like where I really started myself asking like is bartending what I want to do for another 20 years when I've already done it in that window um but yeah I, I stay for so many reasons obviously like I said earlier on the flexibility of earnings and if you know if you can double and triple down if you have the, the gumption and you have the energy and and the the, the lack of need to sleep then you can certainly uh, say oh I have this bill coming up let me pick up you know five extra shifts and uh, forego sleep for a week and I'll be able to pay that off really fast so I definitely as, as a single parent um, that flexibility of schedule in a lot of the places I had worked and the you know the coverage of, of other bartenders that were equally as, as hungry uh, gave me that flexibility as, as a young parent in New York City to be able to drop and pick up where needed um, and a, a staff of very, very um, supportive uh, servers and bartending that would offer free babysitting services while I did work. So it, uh, it fed me in many, many ways and still continues to do so. So it's, um, 
a very, very flexible career path that I love to tell young bartenders and young servers that you don't ever have to be just one thing in this in this industry. You know, you can really write your own ticket if you step back far enough in that forest to see all the trees, you know. Mm. That's really um, that's really well put. Actually, it brings me to like a, a question that we hadn't discussed yet, but maybe could we could each of us offer our views on what exactly we consider hospitality? Because I, I waffle personally, I waffle from time to time explaining what I do to people not in the industry. I'll say I'm in the beverage industry or I'm in the spirits industry or I'll say I'm in hospitality. It's almost like I have to translate every one of those phrases every single time anyway. Um, how, how would you describe the hospitality industry, Justin? Oh my goodness. Um, well, I mean, actually, I think uh, while Joanne was just answering that, I was thinking how much, uh, how beautiful a lot of that is, like the, the moment of um, greeting people from all different kind of spaces, all walks of life, kind of the opportunity to give people an experience and help them to unpack their own experience, to give them a space where like, I mean, there is a, there is an, an an implicit like shouldering of burden a little bit in that in that kind of moment of service there's something really uh really powerful and generous about that um when you when it's when it's being done with so much love um so i think at its at its best that was something that i was uh i can't say you know i was even always very good at that part i think you know sometimes i i pulled it off but i feel like much more of the time it was aspirational to be able to to give people that kind of a that kind of a home and a shelter and a, and, a, and an experience and a space um for I think for me again, you know, like maybe maybe slightly selfishly, it was also always a space to kind of like share something I was excited about. It was you know the opportunity to kind of um, kind of bring my enthusiasm to someone else and give someone an experience that way. You know, it was a much more much more inward looking way of doing it, but um, but still very much like about what I think about sharing about kind of being like we're here to have a communal good time. We're here to have a good communal like um, whether it's a, a taste or a story or a just a gathering of people and a you know, shared time together and experience and we, for a lot of people uh, often myself included you know finding a space to be comfortably around other people and to open up is not always easy and so being able to provide that space for other people i think is an important part of what um, i see as hospitality but you know, there are so many different iterations of it and i completely hear your your comment about like trying to explain what it is that I or we do, you know, it's, it's, I find different, all similarly, I find different terms all the time. Sometimes I say, I, you know, I'm helping to manage a small portfolio. Sometimes I say I'm a you know, spirits educator. Sometimes I say I just work in beverage alcohol. Sometimes I say I work in hospitality. Sometimes I say I work in booze. It depends on who I'm talking to, you know, but um, it's, it, it does become very nebulous, especially once I think you step into these slightly more nebulous roles, but sort of yeah. answer the question. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Joe, what about, what about you? How do you, envision what hospitality really means and what it is that we do? Well, I think there's, for, for me, um, you know, there's there's a couple of the direct kind of correlation of, of the front of that line of being hospitable and, and being a host and whatnot. And that will be your front of the house from your hosts, to your managers, to your bartenders, to your servers. But then behind that line are more lines than you can count, right? Of the support network from yeah. that comes under the same umbrella to me of hospitality so whether that would be you know all the the next line of all the the product support right the the things that we eat the things that we um drink but then the things that we eat off the things that we use the the vessels and then yeah. there, you know i think i mentioned on, on a pre-call what about the, the handymans and what about the contractors that build bars so hospitality as a sector is I think has many more arms than you can count. So you can really think like, oh, is there even a dentist that you know services just bartenders? As in you can you can niche your way into the hospitality sector, and really really make yourself you know essential within that you know within that community to be considered part of that community. So you know shout out shout out to dentist and Trong. Yeah, here in, in New York City. <laughs> yeah, are, are my root canal early this morning? That's uh, you know, I'm numbing for you know. But yeah, so I think there's I think there's just a lot of lines in the army that we are. There is just many many um, layers to that. So I don't think if any one person stopped being a bartender or server or manager, 
you know that and they found an adjacent role within the community it doesn't mean that they're out of hospitality to me you know it's um but the, the the very basic definition of it is obviously being the hospitable and being the host and, and connecting to the you know the consumer facing and and touching the consumer in 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 not in reality touching them but you know touching them with words <laughs> but yeah um i think again you know it's Maybe I, I look at the, this world and I am as corny as anything when, when I am the, the, the immigrant in this land, that it really is the land of opportunity to me. You can really invent and write your own story if, if, you, if you're marketed enough and you, you're passionate enough. You can, you can, do you need some wedges and wobble wedges for your tables? I got that business, you know, I mean, whatever it is, let's, uh, you know, let's tuck it under the same kind of heading to me anyway. Um, fabulous answers, friends. Uh, we did get our results back. Um, before I, I share what popped up on my window for our introvert extrovert poll, uh, Joe, how do, how would you describe yourself? Introvert, oh, extrovert, or complicated? I'm absolutely an introvert, and that sh answer shocks everybody. They're like, "Yeah, right," you know, because you know, you've you've been you've partied with me, you've worked with me, you've seen how I am, and I can I find it very easy to be around people in that moment, but you don't see me going to the bathroom and, and hyperventilating in the stall, going, okay, you've got you've got this for another twenty minutes, or going home and having to um, unburden the energy of of other interactions and other humans, you know, when I get to my own home. So for me, you know things like Tales of the Cocktails in the summertime and people see me at one or two events a year, that might be, you know, that's, that, that's a large chunk of my, my social ability, you know, that uh, I'm, I'm very, very happy in my own head and I'm very happy with my, you know, my daughter and in my own cave. Um, but I'm trying to work on being more of a introverted extrovert, that kind of hybrid person of trying to find a bit of better balance because um, us introverts have, have, have a very, slick slope of sliding into a recluse completely um so for the last two decades i've definitely had more elements of that that uh is the, a longer answer to answering yes or no to that question <laughs> fabulous um justin how about yourself uh, i'm gonna go with the it's complicated option um i'm glad that was on there i think uh so much of my um experience in this in this industry has been uh, has been like a, you know, almost like a, uh, for lack of a better word, like a, like a, an addictive relationship to, to the extroverted experiences, to like being kind of, in, you know, as we were saying before, sort of like in the party, but not necessarily of the party, you know, like, like, um, kind of being around that, being able to kind of like play host and to help offer things, offer, like I'm much more, I'm very comfortable offering a lot of love and offering a lot of like, uh, offering a lot of, of myself, it is very hard for me to like, by contrast, to just be there socially and like, just chill. You know, I find myself like, sl like sliding into the like, well, let me do something for you, you know, like that role very, very rapidly. And that's, that's a lot of my comfort zone is, is, a, is a gregarious, but offering and gregarious, but serving gregarious, but like, um, but, but uh, through the lens of needing to be giving something. Um, when I don't have that on, on my plate in front of me, I kind of want, or if my plate is just full of someone giving me something, I get uncomfortable pretty fast. And I, uh, I wind up kind of turning into like, you know, wanting to, wanting to escape that situation. And I think um, the danger of that has been that like, I've positioned myself in the space of that role so much that, you know, again, it started to really kind of lead to a lot of burnout because, you know, when one does that, because Jan, as uh, Joanne was saying earlier, like you, you start to you start to lose sense of self a little bit. I most of all start to lose uh, track of like self care. I started to really um, lose track of protecting myself physically and mentally, but most of all, most of all physically. Like I was really just beating myself into the ground, and um, it took a long while to realize that. Long after I had already passed deep into that realm of, of self negligence, um, it kind of you know my body kind of sort of slapped me and woke me up to say. You know, you're 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 hurting <laughs> me you're hurting yourself um and so I've, I've kind of tried to lean back into some of those more introverted aspects in the years since to like spend a little bit more time on being at home on my own like personal time on now my family on um 
on the things that I think I was uh, I was sort of willfully running to some degree away from before into that kind of like the, you know the, the jaws of that kind of like uh, offering 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 yourself version of extroversion version of extroversion yeah I think I think um, so yeah I think it's it's complicated it's, it's it's sort of like I'm trying to I have a I would clearly have a deep introvert introverted uh, side that I'm trying to like give I'm trying to empower that part of myself more as I get older uh, and to let it be okay I think is a, a way to say it well put um I think for myself I'm also kind of it, I heard a lot of myself and what you were saying Justin I I think that naturally I'm inclined to consider myself an introvert um because I do get emotionally drained like you Joe um but at the same time I think for me it's complicated because it's it's almost like I'm just obsessive on one or the other. So when I'm behind the bar, I want to be really, really on. Um, and the energy is really high. But then when I'm not behind the bar, like I don't want to answer the phone. I would like to sit on uh, the sofa with the cat for a long time. And so I feel that at least in the hospitality industry, you know, you've got a couple of extremes. You've got the sort of shy um, workers who just want to put their head down and, and make a bunch of drinks in the service well, and you have your uh, performers, right, who just kind of really want to be on stage. Um, but most of us are, are um, balancing those two extremes, you know, and I really think that that idea of the word hospitality being essentially you are that front facing part of hospitality first, but that there's all these supporting roles means that you can um, start to think about your future inside of that larger bracket. And like, maybe you still want to be on the performance side, but you don't necessarily want to be behind the bar. There are many, many uh, sales and guest focused roles that can help you continue being an extrovert. Or maybe you are at a point where you kind of really like doing that, you know, administrative back of house work where you get to select and choose who you give your energy to. And so you can kind of be a little bit more managerial, more directorial, um, or maybe you find a balance of both. And uh, I think when I decided to stay inside the industry, I mostly I could not say no to this job. It really was a dream come true to have two passions, right? Beverage history, um, cocktails, and just like being able to um, still be relatively guest facing. So I, I do think that for myself, if I, because I can get obsessive, if I was only in an office, then um, no one would ever see me again. And I would go from the office <laughs> to the house and I'm, I'm already quite pale, <laughs> but I also, so I kind of need, I need the fact that we're a museum so that I can go out and I can see people. Um, and I don't get to bartend anymore, but like you, Joe, I do get to do a couple of uh, cocktail classes, which is fun. I get to see if my muscles still work. <laughs> Um, but that balance, right, of our introvert and extrovert nature, I think is why at least a lot of the people I've spoken to over the years have chosen to stay in the hospitality industry in some form or another, even if they're not necessarily working till four in the morning and, you know, throwing out their, their knees or their hips, uh, as we all often did. Um, if anyone who is with us live uh, this is being recorded, but if anyone is with us live, they want they want to start thinking about questions um, and throw them in the chat momentarily. Uh, we're going to go through one last sort of sort of broad topic of discussions, and essentially, it's that what along the way in your career journey is um, advice that you were given that you found helpful, um, support that you were given, or even if it's just self reflection on how you ended up in this new role, whether it's been a couple of years or you're still growing it. Um, what is this sort of, what was that good positive push? And do you have, can that be, can that be shared or articulated? Um, Joe, why don't you start? Um, instantly my brain goes to 2010 and my first experience down at Tales of the Cocktail, you know, of, of a, a liquor rep, you know, forcing me to enter a cocktail that I didn't even know what a jigger was, people. Like, I didn't know measurements. I didn't know, you know, they were like, put something in. You, you probably win. Nobody has entered. And I won. And they flew me down to, to New Orleans. I didn't even have a smartphone at the time. So it was like, you know, didn't even know where I was going or what I was going into. Uh, again, my, my knowledge was 
Irish and sports bars in the neighborhood. I didn't have a clue that there wasn't even a cocktail book beyond the little black bartender book that was dusty behind the bar, you know? And I think, um, you know, meeting my people, you know, of, of meeting David Delaney, my fellow competitor and instantly bonding and, you know, been taken by the hand uh, around to meet people that were just so passionate and so educated and so hungry and, and feeling off that energy to be like, wow, this is, this is something, this is, there's something here. And, and, and I think that year of watching caps of going like, oh, there was all these mad people running around. And I was kind of standing there going, who, who are these people and what are they doing? Cause I want to do that. And I didn't win that competition because the person who won automatically got into the cap program the following year, but I left there bawling my eyes out going like, I, I need more of this and asking, how do I get more of this? How, how can I get more plugged in? And everyone's you know, universal answer was like, you follow up, you stay connected, you reach out. And you know, on the plane on the way home to, from New Orleans to New York, I had a stack of napkins of everybody's name written down on it. And I was on, you know, writing, handwriting all my, thank you for meeting me. You, you don't know who I am, but I know, you know, and just doing that follow-up and bugging the crap out of people when I go back to New York of anyone that I had met of saying like, give me more insight, give me, where can I plug into? Uh, and that led to 2011, which you, I constantly did. If I could meet anyone in a street corner and like kind of, get their guard down and ask them stuff, life stuff, nothing to do with the business. Like, tell me about you, tell me about your family, tell me about, you know, and then be like in for the kill of like, how can I, how, how can I stay connected to these people? And, and again, networking, these events are networking events. And I did just that, you know, um, I stayed in the same job in Hell's Kitchen, an Irish sports bar. Um, and I kept doing that for years because again, it was, it was a flexibility and a high earner, probably a very abusive job uh, on reflection. Um, but it gave me flexibility of self while I was simultaneously kind of building out my network and, and seeing opportunities left and right of me, whether I was taking them at the time or not, but I was stockpiling um, the thought process behind uh, different avenues that I could explore, you know, um, up until you know, making a move from that bar into kind of my first um, cocktail, craft cocktail, still Irish bar of this, the, the dead rabbit of still being in that kind of, yeah, it's still a, an Irish, you know, and, and, and shines the whole neighborhood, but it's elevated, right? So it's more craft focused. Um, and I definitely entered a lot of um, cocktail competitions, which is another great way I thought to educate myself. Um, and just like you, Rihanna, like, I, I love the history aspect of things like, when I found out that there was such content um, and such history, I think that was the real hook for me. That was the real fascinating part that, you know, and why I fell in love with New Orleans my first time of just walking around, touching buildings and realizing that there was just such energy and such history to everything about that. Um, I just, I'll never get old, that, that will never get old for me. You know, that's, that's never, go, I'm never gonna get tired of that. Um, and leading up to Cocktail Kingdom, which, you know, my, my boss is, is, is absolutely a big nerd when it comes to everything history and, and, and cocktail book related. So I feel like I was just given the, the almighty prize of having all this at my lap uh, to be able to dive into whatever I wanted in, in, in that forte. So um, I've forgotten even the question now I'm waffling. <laughs> You, you made a lot of uh, you made a lot of strides to um, learn and stay connected in in order to feel supported as you've transitioned into this new role. Yeah. Um, I actually I have, I have another question for you. Um, what you had mentioned briefly that you learned all of these different skills while running the um, the logistics for Cocktail Kingdom and for Miracle. Um, you mentioned I think the last time we spoke that when you were a bar manager, you felt like you needed to have the answers for everything. You needed to know where every light switch was in every room so that if the staff asked you, you knew that you had your finger on every single possible imagined scenario. Um, but now you're running an, a company that has hundreds of locations. What skills have you learned um, really to kind of prepare you for like a, such a drastic change? To get out of my own way, it basically is the, <laughs> is the best one. But yeah, I mean, I'm sure we'll all relate to that one of, of being a manager or a bar manager of yes, of I, I, I think it's essential to be the person with the answers, right? If you're the GM, like you, you need to be able to be like, it's not to say figure it out in those kind of situations when fires are going off, you need to be able to say like, this is here, that's there, we fix this, let's go, let's go people, service is on. So it's rapid fire. 
and understanding how that building works, but it's one building, right? You're in one domain or, or maybe you're managing a couple of, 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 uh, of units or whatnot. So when I found myself in an office environment for the very first time in my career, uh, it was it was really tough there for a couple of months of adapting over to a different type of mindset. And, you know, when you're a bartender and when you're managing the fruits of your label labor are, are evident right there and then, right? So if you have a good bar going, if you have, you know, your, your inventory, inventory to do, if you have a cleaning to do, like you go to work, it's a physicality. At the end of the day, you're sore, you go home, job well done, boss is happy. But in the office environment, I'm there sitting in front of a computer and, and planting seeds more than actually something that I get a return on on a daily basis or even a weekly basis. Here I am communicating with people that I might not get a return on to be able to show my, my, my work. You know, I was, I was kind of sitting there going, how is my boss gonna know that I'm working when I have nothing to show him at the end of the day rather than maybe four quarters down, you know, later in the year. So that was a, that was a very much a big adjustment to me. Um, to realize that I'm still working, I'm still being positive. So I also struggled with, like you said, um, Rhiannon, of just now I'm working in a much larger company that has a, a lot of different arms from manufacturing to production, to art, to legal, uh, the admin side of it. And how could I possibly learn all those skills? But I tried. And it was Greg, you know, who, who has definitely been a great mentor for me to turn around and say, you know, you, you can't bottleneck, you know, the own situation. You have to bring on people that if you might not have the skill set, you hire somebody or bring into your network those that do have that skill set. And, you know, not that I'll ever master what they mastered, but I'll be able to siphon off some of that juice and let them do it and sit back and my team gets stronger because I have allowed people in. I've stopped being lording over that and being lord and master of my own house and saying like i have to do everything i have to touch everything no you don't you can allow people in and um, step back and be a director and be you know the, the 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 one that can see all the moves rather than just one move so bottle your neck bottlenecking on any one task you, you then don't see the bigger picture a lot it, it takes a lot more to step back and, and constantly see the view from that that position um, so that was another adjustment of me of allowing that to happen and realizing that I'm not going to be the master of all tasks and that's okay. Yeah, sound advice. <laughs> um, Justin, the, uh, the sort of advice or the support that you received or that you've sort of learned from um, developing into the position you're in now, um, anything that you can share, any insight there? Yes, um, I've, I've been nervous about this question because I, I feel like so much of what has happened to me in my career has been sort of things that that I feel as though I fell into. And it's sort of like, um, I think you were describing the same sort of thing as sort of like kind of not anticipating that this role, this dream job would exist kind of thing. And I feel like I've had a lot of that same experience. It's sort of like, there wasn't a, you know a, a, an application form out there for me to fill out for this role. And um, It and I mean I have like the lucky position of being essentially kind of headhunted to do something that didn't exist before. Um, but that being said, I think that you know I was reflecting upon it and trying to figure out how to answer this sort of idea. And you know, for the sake of this conversation, I realized that um, the thing that led me to these opportunities has been trying to have a, a clear idea of what it is that I, what my perspective was, and trying to you know. It's like a, the advice that people give to writers a lot. Um, I went to school for writing and have, you know, since you used it professionally, but have not, sort of like you haven't, I haven't wound up smoking close cigarettes and writing poetry all day. Um, I've, I feel like a lot of the, a lot of my professors in uh, the writing program at, at my university were always telling us to, you know, spend, like, but just to keep on spending time on your own writing because it would help you to develop your voice. And that voice is what I think has been, has served me most. It's like spending time with, just, I guess just like forcing myself to keep on asking myself, what is my perspective on all of this? What is it that I believe about this? What is it that I think is important about all this? Um, you know, rather than just kind of like head down, working through the party and having a great time, but also asking myself, like, what does it mean? What is it, like, what, like, what, is, what is my perspective on what we're doing back here behind the bar? What is my perspective on what we're doing when we serve these drinks? And what, you know, what is my perspective on why we choose the bottles we choose? And that's been, that, those questions have been, full stop what led me to all the other opportunities and all the other doorways that have happened to me since then. It's all been because of spending time on 
what is my perspective? So I think as much as possible, my advice is to ask yourself that question and to try to, as you start to have, find answers to it, to, to put, you know, double down on them, drill down on, on, on them and ask yourself more questions. And what, what, are the, what are the next questions after? What is my basic perspective on this thing? Ask more questions. It doesn't have to be about your spirit's choices. It might be about why you're passionate about this part of cocktail history or why you're passionate about this part of service or this methodology or what it, whatever it is. But I think that there's, the more you can kind of like focus in on what, what drives you into that space, um, the more you'll see opportunities present themselves because of it. That's great advice. Um, I will share the, the, the one thing that really motivated me through going to school part-time in my mid thirties, which was, um, you know, I, I, I mentioned I started at community college. So I was really honestly surrounded by high school students who had just graduated and I was taking like remedial math because it had been 15 years since I had a math class. And I was really beating myself up over how long it was gonna take in order to uh, get a degree that I, you know, let's be honest, history degree wasn't really ever going to be positioned to be lucrative. Um, but I just, I knew I wanted it and it was just, but I want everything, you know, I, I want everything almost more immediately than, um, than can be done. And uh, a really great friend gave me some advice or really just some, said something simple saying, you know, Rhiannon, you're still going to finish your degree faster than anyone who didn't go back to get one. And even though I had to go part-time every semester, every summer for years and just kind of did it under the radar, eventually I got it and it made me feel really, really good. I felt a great sense of accomplishment and in a specific branch of the hospitality industry, things like you know working for corporations, generally uh, an undergrad degree is at this point kind of required. So it's, it's, I'm glad I got it. And I'm really grateful for that advice because I think it's an easy thing to just say, you know what, screw this. I know I can make a quick buck slinging drinks, you know, to hell with planning for the future. Um, but really just slow and steady can really position, can position you for success later in other parts of what we do. Mm -hmm. um, I, feel, I, I wanted to, like, oh, go ahead, please. Can I, can I, can I, I feel like that also kind of doubles down on Something Joe was just saying that I would also like to, I mean, I was also thinking about the question you asked her about what are some of the skills that you developed. Um, and I think that when, for all my many, you know, many years behind the bar, so much of the time, it was not, it was like short-term thinking, even, you know, just in, in, in the case of like a service. And it's like, you're working in a space where it's all, it's not just immediate return. It's also like your problems, the things you're dealing with it are rarely much outside of like the next order fire, the next ticket, the next, whatever you're dealing with right now. And it's like you're putting out a lot of fires, a lot of dealing with, immediate things, which is a skill set that served me very well in other spaces since then. But um, the the long term, like developing a perspective that I was talking about, or the long term kind of like um, spending time on on your long term goals that you're talking about, these are, I think are also similar to what Joe was talking about, about like kind of basically we're all saying kind of expanding your your, it's like your long game, expanding like what are you, what do you, how, like what perspective are you bringing to, yeah, I mean, I guess goals is really the best thing, but it, it's, it's, a, it's an expansion of your depth perception about what's ahead of you. And um, that was a really hard skill to learn um, because I had spent so many years just being immediate and reactive, but, um, but trying to spend time on like that, that longer, that like that proactive uh, vision of myself as well um, was a really important skill to develop. And uh, I couldn't do what I do now without it. And it has also, again, been a guidance, so. Awesome, thank you. Great of that one, absolutely. I'm still hunger. I'm still hungry, but the, the hunger has changed. You know, I'm just hunger for more. Um, you know, you know the whole saying of like, you know, living to work, which I think mm -hmm. a lot of us bartenders absolutely for large periods of our, our careers absolutely live to work, chasing it, chasing that high, chasing those competitions, chasing those interactions. I'm now at a point in my life in my you know mid forties of saying. Um, I want to, you know, like the opposite, right? I want to absolutely live. I want, I'm finding my Zen, I'm finding my calm. Um, and that hunger and that chase doesn't, they don't correlate anymore. So my hunger now is to find just the tranquility and, you know, more sense of self, which uh, is definitely, is, is definitely a good place to be in because it just makes you, uh, see things a little bit more clearly. I feel past, present, and the future. I'm like the the Buddha Zen of fucking. Uh... <laughs> I love it. I need to have conversations.
conversations with you guys like every week. That'd be fantastic. Um, so if you're still live with us uh, on the webcast, this is your opportunity to put in any questions um, you might have for myself, Joe, or uh, Justin. And I did want to share that out of the introvert, extrovert, it's complicated poll, uh, we are evenly split. There is an equal amounts of it's complicated introverts and extroverts, um, which just goes to show you, it's, you know, the hospitality industry attracts very complex personality types. Um, we'll give it maybe a handful of seconds to see if anyone has any questions, um, go ahead and throw them in the chat. Um, but this is definitely not the last opportunity that you guys have to reach out to the three of us. Um, we can be found pretty easily. Um, again, I work at Sazerac House. So if you're in New Orleans, it's a complimentary tour. Um, we did want to find out, I think Tails is asking, if how did you hear about this webinar? So that poll probably has just popped up on your screen. Just let us know how you found out about it. And they're also going to plug in the, uh, the socials for myself, Joe, and Justin into the chat, I believe, so that you can follow us. Um, I have to confess, I'm very infrequently on the Instagram. Um, I don't even, I think my coworkers made my Instagram tag at the Sazerac lady. Um, but Joe, Justin, do you guys have any final thoughts or questions um, or anything else that you'd like to say? Just kind of echoing, you know, what you just said, if, if anybody uh, ever wants to contact me on any subject, uh, you know, they knock on those, uh, on, on those social doors and, um, you know, uh, working in New York and working with Cocktail Kingdom and, and Miracle Franchise um, definitely gives me uh, enough to talk about. So if any of those uh, under those headings might be something that you're interested in, holler <laughs> at me and I'm available. Same. Yeah, please don't, don't be shy. You can hit me up anytime. I'm happy to uh, give advice to fellow CAPs and CAP enthusiasts and uh, anybody else who, you know, is, is in peripherally or not in our, in our field, you know, I'm always down to talk and, and, and shoot the, shoot the SHIT. Um, I, uh, I guess I also wanted to, on the note of spelling out curse words, I guess I also, one, one last thing I wanted to kind of bring up because I think it's important to where my narrative is at these days and to what, what has kind of helped me feel really reassured about the choices that I've made over the last eight years to like move out of me I, you know, again I was always sort of like ride or die fucking uh there I go crazy anyway um like like I'll never be a day walker you know like like bartend till you die kind of thing um <laughs> has been the change of, of like quality of life it's there's 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 a you know an opportunity to have like um I don't know a child to have energy in the morning to be with that child <laughs> um that I didn't, I don't think I could have even imagined before, uh, before making that transition in my life, um, because I was waking up exhausted, if not hungover, most days, you know, like waking up like at the very least physically spent. Um, and that's, you know, that, that it takes so much energy to, to, to be so present in your life mm -hmm. that um, you don't know what you're not experiencing about that until you start making that change and experiencing it. And then it's sort of like, wow, why haven't I been, I've been missing some of these other parts of my life for so long. So um, just if, you, if anyone's feeling like um, uncertain about making a similar transition, uh, there is a lot of joy and benefit to be had on the other side of that as well. Just, yeah. Agreed. When, when that light bulb goes off, Justin, right, it really is like, holy shit, have I really thrown that much of myself, you know, away? Have, have, I, have I lost that much of me? So yeah, huge, huge um, light bulb moment when you realize that uh, I hate when people refer to things what we do for ourselves is like oh i need to be a little selfish no that's not selfish it's it's looking after yourself is not selfish people anyone listening you know it mm -hmm. is essential mm -hmm. um we did get one quick question uh from alex said um that they are in the process of transitioning from bar manager into a beverage director role and what advice do you have for maintaining a presence and leadership role in the restaurant while spending the bulk of your time at a desk or sorry at a desk instead of behind the bar hmm. I, I, I can go first um, um i think that uh giving yourself space and uh and i guess i guess permission slash authority to uh, to step into an observational role with regularity but also giving yourself permission to 
and space to keep that limited, I think are, are kind of the two, the double-edged sword of it. it. It's like, I think if you remove yourself too much and become too administrative, then I mean, I think probably where you're the concern you're voicing is that you start to become disconnected and start to feel a little bit like I'm telling people what to do without knowing how that experience is playing out for them without actually having my finger in surface, that kind of thing. Um, but I think it, the other danger is to then um, be so so present for it that you that you 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 actually are just even more deep into the mix and lose that that opportunity to have a little bit more sense of, uh, of self and and um, preservation that way. So I think um, yeah, for me it was a big re re realization that I could like I could step in and then also entrust people and delegate with people and step back out again and that people need that space too. People need that room to like grow in themselves. They need that room to to execute and to figure out what needs to be improved by your plan and to figure out because you can't always see it when you're alone doing the whole thing, you know? Um, so I guess, that's, yeah, that's my best piece of advice personally is to to both make sure you're taking the space to step into it and also make sure you're giving yourself like a clear, like, and, I'm, and now I'm done. And, and like the yes, I'll be there and the no, I'll be out, you know? Yeah, I'm echoing exactly that. And, and just making sure your, your communication skills are even more on point when you're not physically there so that, you know, your downline, yeah. your, your other arms of management that take your, your work and activate it, right? And activate it with their, their bartender and servers, that they're taking that. And it's not like Chinese whispers, okay? It's, it's an actual, it's a science. Like you, you're putting in a program, that program has to be followed through. So it's, you know, not just putting a thought out and then you're the next manager going, that sounds like a nice idea. I'm going to change it. No, no, no. It is making sure your communication and you're organized all the way down through your line so that the person at the end of that receiving that, whether it's their first day, their first week, their first month, knows your vision, knows knows your program and is, is as empowered as you are writing that program to sharing it with your managers and, and training them in as they are sharing it with the guests. So each of those mm -hmm. lines have to be as strong as what you are doing at that office desk. Um, there's, we can sit there for days and months and type away at our keys, but it is only as good as how it is activated and shared. Mm -hmm. It's true. You, you, have, you have any, any, any advice for Anna? Um, yeah, I honestly think a lot of it to me comes down to time management because for me, I can get locked into a cycle on my, at my desk and I just, I need to finish this to-do list. I need to finish this spreadsheet. I need to finish this project. Um, and it's really important to make sure that whatever system you need to put in place where you're like, nope, I need to stop this project so I can call or FaceTime or be in person for this one instance, or mm -hmm. I need to only give myself a couple of hours to work on this in the morning so that I know I can go and like make the rounds physically. Um, and time management is just something that I need to rely on uh, because I do get I do get tunnel vision very easily, especially when there's a project that's not due. Yeah. And organization is key to success and something that my mother drilled into me and I'd roll my eyes out. And I am my mother now because it really is true. It really is true. <laughs> but if you're disorganized, don't feel bad. I'm super disorganized and I'm like figuring it out. So yeah, organized you know. chaos, Justin. It's organized <laughs> chaos. That's still yes, organization exactly. in my book. <laughs> <laughs> Um, oh, I think that's us wrapping up. Um, thank you everyone who tuned in live. Thank you everyone who is watching this recorded on the Tales of the Cocktail Foundation's YouTube channel. Um, thank you to Don Q. Thank you to Sylvia Santiago. Um, and it, like I said, if you guys have any questions, our social medias uh, tags are up in the chat. You can always reach out to us um, at our respective uh, social accounts and websites. Um, Joe, Justin, it's been really great chatting with you and learning about your unique journeys and re-envisioning re yourself in the hospitality industry. Likewise. And yeah, thank, thank you for- to, uh, Trevor, before we sign off, that uh, oh. we to you, Trevor. And, um, <laughs> yeah, yeah, and thank you very much for facilitating uh, myself and Justin in this uh, great conversation with you guys. Um, I love yeah, you. thanks for inviting us. Yeah, for, yeah, truly. I think it's, it's, a, it's a really wonderful opportunity to kind of to share that and uh, um, ask, ask questions about it also. <laughs> Thank you. Awesome. Thanks for always being inspiring, guys. Cheers. Thank you, everybody. Cheers.